Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. When the young are sexually abused, psychological scars are left that may never be healed. One common experience is grief, that gnawing sadness that's always just below the surface. Stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. Pastor Lutzer, can the pain of sexual abuse as a child ever really go away? Well, Dave, I think it might not go away. And I mention that with a heavy heart because I don't know of anything that makes us as angry righteous anger against those who would do something to harm a child like that. And yet, being realistic, I read somewhere that about one out of every four children is sexually abused. So it's all throughout our culture. And the farther we drift from God, the more abuse there will be. But at the same time, we who believe the Bible, we who believe in Jesus Christ are deeply committed to pointing people to him because we are convinced that he's the one who heals our souls. And remember, Jesus is the one who said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's why we point people to the scriptures, to the book that gives us hope. Oftentimes, David will, uh, will uh, complain to God, I mean, very honestly. He'll just let it all hang out. God, where are you? I need you. Things are so bad. Why don't you show up for me? He'll just pour out his soul, and, and he'll just uh, lay it all out. And at the end of the psalm, he says, Nevertheless, I will still hope in thee. You're saying, where in the world does that come from? My friend, grief does two things. First of all, it reminds us that there are some scars that will never be taken away permanently until we get to heaven. Grief reminds us of that, and that's why we cry over what has been done and it can't be undone. But there's something else that grief does, and that is it gives us hope. And if there's no way for you to really express your grief and to pour out your soul before God, read the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is a book that was written by Jeremiah. It is filled with tears over the destruction of Jerusalem. I wish I had time this morning to take you there and to show you how all of his his innards are spilled out there in his tears. There's nothing wrong with grieving the loss. You lose an arm, you grieve. You lose your childhood, you grieve. Grieve over what could have been. Don't be afraid of grief. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Third, and this is absolutely crucial, of course everything that I'm saying today is crucial, but uh, third, you must understand grace. You must understand grace. Now I'm going to speak to those of you who were abused. This is your tendency. Your tendency is to so focus on the sins of others that you overlook your own. And no matter how your sins might be pointed out, you're continually saying, yeah, but I didn't do that. And so your focus is on somebody else's sin. At this point, I'm talking about your own because we are all sinners. And if you have been sinning against others because you've been sinned against, you and I have a lot to forgive. I have a lot that God has to forgive. And I suspect that you do too. But when it comes to forgiveness, people make one huge mistake. What is the major mistake when it comes to forgiveness? It is thinking that they have to become worthy of it. If I could just be worthy of it and and tell God, well, you know, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. If I could just do that, maybe then I'd experience forgiveness. You come to God like that and you'll continue your obsessions. Because that's not the basis of forgiveness. The interesting thing is that in the New Testament, forgiveness is totally a free gift independent of your performance. That is what grace, it is totally undeserved. 
It is the kind of gift that God gives to us, and that's our calling card when we want to knock on the door of heaven. When you get onto a plane, the stewardess doesn't say, well, now, you know, are you worthy to fly? Have you had a good day? Have you had your devotions today? That's not what the stewardess is interested in, the flight attendants of today. What they want to know is the ticket is your uh, authenticity. And God says, you have Jesus who died in your place, and that is the answer to your neurosis and your guilt. Whether you are an abuser or abused, the answer is the same. Jesus died for horrendous sinners. That's the answer. In fact, the Bible says very clearly that we are justified by his blood. We are redeemed by his blood. And then don't you like this? Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, now unto him who, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's all a gift. You come to God exactly as you are. Luther was absolutely right when he said, O oh Jesus, I am thy sin, thou art my righteousness. Once you understand that Jesus died in your place, if you were abused as a child, even if you felt guilt because you participated And the way in which you did, the answer is the same for you. It's the same for all of us because there is only one way to be freed forever. And that is to accept the work that Jesus did and receive it by faith and by grace. You know what I've been praying for you this week? I've been praying that you will feel the forgiveness of God to the very depths of your being so that you don't have to live in that purgatory of despair, wondering where you live with God, that you will feel it deeply. And as for those of you who are abusers, you too can receive that grace, though I'm going to have more to say to you in the next message. And the next message in this series is about a woman whose story was not redeemed. Whose story was not redeemed. By the way, this title, I wish I could take a credit for it. It was given to me. Rebecca and I were having lunch with a couple that began an organization for those who are abused. And she said, we just help people to let God redeem their story. And I said, what a, what a fantastic title this is. Let God redeem your story. And so next time we'll talk about somebody who didn't let God redeem her story and what we can learn about our own story being redeemed. You've got to understand grace. God's reach is as far as sin reaches. And where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And you sin and God can heap up grace to cover it. And you must grab that or you will never have the settled assurance, I stand in the presence of God forgiven. Isn't that great? Isn't that great that we stand in the presence of God forgiven? Next is a little bit more difficult. You must now practice forgiveness. Now that you've understood it, now you've got to practice it. I wish I could say that your abuser is going to come to you and say, oh, would you forgive me for the terrible things I've done? Oh, I'll tell you, that doesn't happen very often. As we shall see next time, abusers justify, rationalize, deny. So what are you going to do? That's my question. You're going to hang on to your desire for revenge? Are you going to say to yourself, I am owed justice? My friend, always remember that being willing to give up your revenge and your anger is not in any way a minimizing of the sin that has been given to you and happened to you. The Bible just simply tells us to commit it to God. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay, says the Lord. And so what you need to do is you really need to get rid of that. And uh, getting rid of it, you know, someone has said that holding on to your revenge is something like you drinking poison and then you are expecting your abuser to die. (laughs) Well, he's not going to be affected by the fact that you are drinking poison. He or she is not going to be affected by that. You will be. I know that forgiveness is both an act and a process. 
It is not something that you just say, well, you know, I casually forgive. Yeah, yeah. You, you say that as an act, and then you begin to live it out, and when it comes back, you affirm its forgiveness. You say, I'm not going to re- keep revisiting this and going back to this because I have forgiven, God knows, and in the process, the healing continues. But do not live with bitterness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away from you, the Apostle Paul says. And be tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgave you. Your abuser will probably not ask for it. But you need to be free. And give it to God and pour it out at the foot of the cross. So we have to practice forgiveness. Next, we have to rewrite, rewrite your story. There's a woman who wrote a book about this. She used the Beatitudes to rewrite her story. Now, let me give you some information here that's transforming. All the information, actually, that I'm giving to you today is transforming. But what you need to do is to reprogram your mind. Your mind that just plays the same tape over and over and over again. Have you ever had that at a tape recorder or the old records? They were the ones. There was a groove in them. And they just used to play the same lines over and over and over again. You young people, just to explain that there was a time when people actually (laughs) used records. I know that dates me, but I even remember it. And that's being played in your mind over and over again. The vengeance, the anger, the justification for your behavior, it's it's all there being played. You need to reprogram your mind. And you do it through the washing of water through the word. So that you are reading the Psalms, you are memorizing scripture, you are saying to yourself, I will no longer be defined by what happened to me, I will be defined because I belong to Jesus, I belong to a new family, I have a Father in heaven who understands and who has compassion, and I will believe that. Though for some of you that's difficult to believe, but God has his purposes in all things as to what happened to you. And that I am going to begin to think of myself and have my mind renewed by the word of God so that I begin to think different thoughts and be reprogrammed. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. By it, we are healed. By it, we are instructed. By it, we are given hope. If you're languishing today because of your past and you are not reading the Word of God and cleansing your mind and meditating and memorizing on things that are positive and helpful and that help you to understand who you really are in Christ, no wonder you continue in your neurosis. No wonder you do that because your mind needs to be renewed. Do that for six weeks two months, three months, and you'll begin to notice a remarkable difference. And you know what? The people that you live with will even notice a difference. Because when we are changed, remember, we impact others by that change. Finally, and there's more that could be said, you have to establish healthy relationships. You see, you have to establish healthy relationships because, you know, you do need a safe place a place where you can trust again, a place where you can feel again. And that's what you need. You really do. And you know, those of you who are battling specifically evil spirits because of what has happened to you and there's this whole struggle within you of evil and and there's a presence there, let me remind you that evil has been decisively defeated thanks to Jesus who disarmed. who disarmed all principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over the minute and saying, here's the victory. I love this illustration. The serpent has been taken. And uh, just imagine a serpent and and you're taking the heel of your boot and you're just taking his, his head and you're just grinding it like that into the gravel. 
That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. If you think you have to be bound, you're believing a lie. Jesus won that victory for you too. We're not asking you to do the impossible here. We're asking you to simply believe the impossible. And God will do it. God will do it. People need to be validated. I wrote two books. Actually, it's more than that. But I wrote one entitled, Dory, the Girl Nobody Loved. Dory Vanstone came into our lives. She became a close friend. I wrote up her story. When I wrote up that story, she had not told me that she was sexually abused in the orphanage in California. She had only told me about all the abuse in the foster homes because she couldn't handle that yet. When we wrote the second book, No Place to Cry, she confessed to me what happened in the orphanage. I turned away and had to get out my handkerchief and took off my glasses because I couldn't stop the tears that were beginning to drip onto my cheeks. I forgot about that. After all, I was doing a book with her, and so that was just part of the discussion. Years later, years later, she said, you know, the fact that you felt so deeply and those tears helped me just a little bit more on my journey toward wholeness. Because somebody validated what happened to her and took it seriously. And I'm not saying for a moment that I was able to feel what she felt as a child. I could visualize it, but I didn't have that kind of a childhood. I went to bed without crying at night. She did virtually every night. And so what we need to do is to validate people. Now, here's what we're going to do. In a few moments, I'm going to give an invitation, as I mentioned. And we're going to ask you to come here, and I'm going to be standing up here. And I want to shake hands with everybody who comes down today. And I don't know whether or not it's going to be a lot of people or a few people or no people. Hey, it's all up to God. This isn't our business. It's God's business. Whatever he wants to do, that's what we want to be available to do. And then uh, some members of the pastoral staff and Mary Welchel, they're going to be up here with me and they're going to direct all those that come into a counseling room behind me. And uh, if more come, we have more prayer partners, uh, elders for the men and uh, deaconesses for the ladies. And I'm going to invite them to come as well, depending on the response that we see today. Because I have no idea how this is going to turn out. And then afterwards, immediately after I've been shaking hands and giving some instruction as we sing the last song, I'm going to be walking off into the counseling room, give you a few more suggestions of how to come to God, and then open it up just for you to pray. You have to talk to God. And you can just pray for as long as you want to pray, though I will be ending it shortly after giving you enough time, depending on how we sense the Spirit working. And then before you leave, I want you to talk to a prayer partner. The prayer partners do not have any wisdom to impart to you, except encouragement. They are there primarily to simply validate you, to hear as much of your story as you are willing to tell them, bits and pieces, as much as you are willing to share, or as little as you are willing to share, or none. They're there, though, for you, because what they want to do is to individually pray for you. We want everybody who comes forward to have been prayed for. But before we sing together, I have one more story, and that is the story of Samantha. (sighs) Samantha is 45 years old. She's an expert musician, beautiful but having a whole lot of difficulties in relationships. Sexually confused. Fact is that Samantha was abused by her father. Emotionally, totally shut down. Just basically a robot. A counselor said, Samantha, I need to help you to get in touch with your feelings, because after all, you know, you do have feelings. And the counselor got her to find a picture when Samantha was three years old. And the counselor said, 
this was before the abuse began. She said, yes, the abuse began when she was about five. He said, write a poem regarding you there as a three-year-old. This is what Samantha wrote. Who will cry for this little girl? Who will quiet her tears of pain? Who will reach for this little girl? Who will shelter her from the rain? Please, won't you hold me and just let me cry? Say words of comfort and wipe my sad eyes. Please, don't you play or just spend some time? Because being with me would be very fine. I hear words of anger and I try to hide. But the words are so cutting and they hurt deep inside. I long for attention and for someone to care. I feel like that's bad, so I hide in despair. I've learned to be strong, but I feel very weak. Oh, Lord, help me find the wholeness I seek. I don't pretend today to say that all that you have to do is come forward. For many of you, it's beginning. For others of you who are on your journey, it's a... It's another step toward wholeness. But I pray for the wholeness that you will seek. Are you ready? Let's pray. Let's sing. I'll be here. Pastor Hutz is going to close the service today because I want to be with those who come forward. And I will give instructions if others have to come forward. Father... Take these brief words and do with them as you will. But we pray that captives shall be freed today and that this terrible sin will not only be forgiven, but there might be healing in people's souls. We pray these things in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. You know, my friend, I'm so deeply touched by that poem that in a moment I'm going to be praying again. I'm going to be praying for you. We're living at a time when there is a lot of abuse going around, oftentimes because of addiction, alcoholism, drugs, you name it. But at the same time, we as ministers of the gospel, we have to be able to bring healing and hope to people. So I want to speak to you as to where you are at on your spiritual journey. If you've been hurt by others, if you have been abused, especially if you've been abused as a child, my heart goes out to you today. But I also believe that the heart of Jesus Christ goes out to you. I remember clearly in the scriptures that Jesus took the little ones in his arms and he held them and he blessed them. Well, as much as possible, we here at Running to Win would like to bless you today. We'd like to be able to say to you that we care about your spiritual journey. And we do that with a heart of compassion, but also pointing you to Christ, because we cannot do for you what he can do for you. Would you join me as we pray one more time? Father, I want to pray for all those who have heard this message. For all those who perhaps are echoing the words of Samantha, a little girl who was abused, dealing with abuse, the pain, the anger, the frustration, would you give them hope today? Would you help them, Father, to come to you and not to walk away, but to come to you in faith, come to you with brokenness, but at the same time with a sense of anticipation and hope? because you welcome all who come into your presence, no matter where they are at. Draw many people to yourself for forgiveness, for acceptance, and the wonder of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You can write to us at Running to Win, 1635 North LaSalle Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60614. To understand why people become sexual abusers, we need to understand the why of dysfunctional families. Next time, a look at an Old Testament family scandalized by abuse and the awful damage that resulted. 
Running to Win is all about helping you understand God's roadmap for your race of life. This is Dave McAllister. Running to Win is sponsored by the Moody Church.